Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Giovanna Scorsone and I am the Education Manager here at the Aga Khan Museum. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today to what promises to be a very inspiring afternoon exploring many of the complexities of what it means to be a Canadian artist today. Hopefully you've had a chance to see the exhibit, our newest exhibit upstairs here, locating contemporary Canadian artists. But if not, not to fear, you'll have a chance after this discussion. And I'm sure everyone will appreciate looking at the art with a deeper understanding of the experiences and thoughts that the artists share with us today. The Aga Khan Museum opened almost three years ago in September 2014. During this time, we've presented exhibitions highlighting everything from exquisite Mughal min miniature painting, the marvelous creatures found in medieval art from places all along the Silk Roots, to contemporary Arab artists exploring the shape-shifting politics and culture of the Middle East and North Africa, and the ancient masterpieces and modern creations from the living history of Syria, among others. With here, locating contemporary Canadian artists, we welcome our first showcase of Canadian art. This exhibit connects perfectly with the museum's overall mission, which is dedicated to advancing the values of pluralism by connecting cultures through the universally accessible language of art. The 21 artists featured in here come from diverse backgrounds with many places, influences, and experiences adding to their identity as Canadian artists and contributing to our social fabric. Today's speakers belong to many places themselves, including Toronto, Saskatoon, Vancouver, Montreal, Berkeley, Baghdad, Glasgow, Asmara, Brooklyn, Maidenhead, and New Delhi. While the backgrounds are diverse, what connects all these artists and artworks is that they explore and question the complex identities and layered histories of people, places, and objects. So it is fitting that we open this exhibit in a city as multicultural as Toronto, and in an institution devoted to the pluralism, uh, as, uh, devoted to pluralism as the Aga Khan Museum. Our hope is that here will resonate in a city and a country that has achieved 150 years of nationhood through an evolving sense of progressive pluralism. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the Aga Khan Museum sits, known as Takaranto, and honor the stewardship, past, present, and future, of the Huron-Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This acknowledgement is especially important for us here today, because here is the Aga Khan Museum's way of marking the 150th year of Canada's formation as a nation. With all our many identities, we acknowledge the people who first welcomed newcomers to Turtle Island. This is a good time to remind you to turn your cell phones to silent. Um, there is no photography or video recording during the, the talk. Uh, and before we begin, I, I welcome you here to the museum. Our role is to connect cultures through art and encourage people to think differently about each other and themselves and how we fit into the connected fabric of society. So we're fortunate to have Swapna Tamhane with us as the creative driver uh, behind this exhibit and to guide us through our discussion today. Aside from her work creating this exhibit at the museum and writing our beautiful catalog, which I encourage you to take home today when you leave, uh, it's available in our shop. Um, Swapna has been studying closely the Indian performance artist Rumana Hussain. Her research developed into a large group exhibition in order to join the political in a historical moment exploring an international generation of women artists born between 1947 and 1957. This exhibition was held at the Museum Abtiberg Munchen Gladbach in Germany and Gallery MMB. And Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangra Sangrahalaya, Mumbai, India from 2014 to 2015. Swapna has exhibited at Focus Photography Festival Mumbai Art Gallery of Mississauga, Gallery 7, Delhi, and A Space Gallery, Toronto. Her book, Sar, The Essence of Indian Design, curated with fashion designer Rashmi Varma, explores the history of material culture and memory. And today we are fortunate to have her here to introduce us to the exhibit and to guide us through discussion with the artists. So please join me in welcoming 
Swapna Tamhane. Thank you, Giovanna, and thank you for acknowledging the land. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited and honored to engage in discussion with Babak Golkar, Sakena Kuba, it's beautiful in red, Napsadu, Jarrett Vadera, and Dawit Petros. Um, there are also many artists who are joining us today in the audience, uh, Samir Farouk, Sean Saeed, Nahid Mansour, Charlene Bambouet. In a way, uh, we've been having several conversations over the past year in preparation for this exhibition, and in some cases, many years, for instance, with um, artists like Jarrett. I do apologize for the incredible imbalance of having just one woman on her own, Sukena, with these four male artists, but I think she will hold her own. The exhibition here, Locating Contemporary Canadian Artists, is the result of an invitation to have an exhibition of Canadian art at the Aga Khan Museum, in line with Canada 150. Numbers are a funny thing. They can set definitive, definitives from certain perspectives and are totally irrelevant in relation to what kind of numerical system or calendar one might follow. I have centered this exhibition around an artifact from the permanent collection that has several time periods inscribed onto it. On this side, you can see carving from the Roman period, and on the other, there is Kufic script. This artifact was reused. It was initially part of a building, but then was repurposed as a tombstone in the 10th century common era, or A.H. Jamada 377. I have placed this artifact, the stele, centrally in the exhibition on the second floor, as it speaks to each of the works selected for this exhibition and connects to this idea of here as an object that has been moving through different geographies since the third century. Here continues to shift. When thinking about artists from Canada or connected to Canada, the idea of here is slippery. Some are working in Vancouver, but like Babak, for instance, exhibits in Brussels or in Dubai. Some like Nepp and Jarrett are working out of Brooklyn or Toronto, but maintain a strong link with Delhi. Their relationship to here is ever shifting. So I will briefly introduce each artist and show some past works. We will have a moderated discussion for about an hour and then have about 15 minutes to 30 minutes for um, a Q&A with you, the audience. So I'll begin with Babak Golkar. So while Babak's Fox has taken over the marketing for the exhibition because it's so good and so compelling, uh, here are a few images of his past works. Babak Golkar was born in Berkeley in California in 1977 and he has spent most of his formative years in Tehran until 1966 when he moved to Canada, um, and then a decade later obtained a Master's of Fine Arts from the University of British Columbia. Through a variety of forms, including drawing, print, ceramics, sculpture, and installation, Babak's subjects emerged from his interest in spatial analysis in relation to contemporary human conditions. He has generated a practice steeped in the juxtaposition of disparate traditions, and by extension, new forms and meanings emerge from recontextualization skewing the asserted certainty of perspective and questioning its formal grounds for reference as well as subsequent ideological viewpoints, Golkar engages a critical inquiry into cultural and socioeconomic systems, exploring the physical position of the body in relation to form, physical points of reference, and spatial relationships. Golkar subsequently echoes social, cultural, political states of mind in his work. A key investigation is the critique of economic systems, as seen in the two works selected for this exhibition, which are from this larger series titled Time Capsules. So these are all various objects that have artworks embedded within. So this fox is not the artwork, but is in fact a container or a holder for an artwork which is not to be opened for another 100 years and opening it before will make the artwork void and of no value. Babak's solo exhibitions include The Exchange Project, INCA in Seattle, Time to Let Go, Vancouver Art Gallery at the Offsite Space, Paragon, Sharjah Contemporary Art Museum, and Mechanisms of Distortion at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Selected group exhibitions include Decor, Fondation Bogosian, Villa and Payne, Brussels, Crisis of History, Beyond History, Framer Framed, Amsterdam, Common Grounds, Museum Villa Stuck in Munich, 
Lavenir at the 9th uh, Bayonne de Montreal. And Golker works and resides in Vancouver and is represented by Third Line Dubai and Sabrina Amrani in Madrid. So next we have Sakena Kuba. Sakena was born in Baghdad and currently lives in Glasgow where she's an artist and lecturer at the Glasgow School of Art, uh, where she also received her master's in letters in 2012 with a concentration in painting. Prior to this, Sakena studied architecture at McGill in Montreal. So she's a visiting lecturer on the Master of Research and Creative Practices and cur gives curatorial support for the School of Design at the GSA. Sakina works with industrial architectural materials like rubber and latex. Over the last few years, her work has developed by drawing from her backgrounds in architecture and painting. Through appropriating structure and the parametric from one and formal perception intuitive construction from the other, she has been developing a methodology of constructing frameworks for projects as genres, arising from the weaving of contextual, historical, literary, and or personal narratives. Frameworks within which she allows processes of free association, intuitive material experimentation, and image manipulation to connect and interweave through the space of presentation. She has started to approach projects as fictional or speculative constructions, akin to architectural non-constructed projects that exist in the realm of the imagined. They, however, still maintain a visual or physical tactile manifestation. Kuba's latest exhibition was Double Blind with Natalie McGowan at the Intermedia Gallery at the CCA in Glasgow. Past exhibitions also include As You Were at Glasgow International, Work Out, a solo exhibition at Hillary Crisp Gallery in London, and Le Swimming at Glasgow International in 2014, and this work, Lucy Donna, at un the Underground Car Park in 2014. In the project for the Aga Khan Museum, she has installed a large latex varnish rug. Sorry, I managed to get you in this picture, Sakina, as we were installing, <laughs> so she's right there. Um, so the large rug is next to a second copy that is considered as a scroll or a plan, this kind of idea of the maquette. Uh, a sort of diagram for the large piece, which is then replicated in form, image, and material. Kuba's History of the Defeated, which is designed and made specifically for the open space where it is hung, is an abstraction, but its image is connected to scans of latex on a flatbed scanner. So she has painted with varnish and ink the light that comes through the scan and is also considering the transference of light through the latex. This work has connections to this particular carpet in a family photograph that she sent. And this carpet depicts an episode in the story of Yusuf, the biblical prophet Joseph, slave of Al-Aziz, and Zuleika, wife of Al-Aziz, chief of Egypt. Um, I might ask you later to elucidate on that. Her work also recalls this incredible drawing that her uncle had uh, made of her, their grandmother's home, uh, which was originally built in 1761. And he did the drawing from memory. So she's referring to screens. Uh, and the sort of mushrobia patterning. Next we have Dawit Petros. Dawit was born in Asmara, Eritrea. He has lived in Saskatoon and Montreal and now lives and works in New York and Chicago. He is a visual artist who investigates boundaries in artistic, geographical, and cultural contexts. Working with installations, photography, research, and extensive travels, his practice centers around a critical rereading of the relationship between African histories and European modernism. By drawing upon forms rooted in diverse histories, Petrus's artistic language enables a metaphorically rich articulation of the fluidity of contemporary transnational experiences and issues of placemaking and cultural negotiation. He completed an MFA in visual arts as a Fulbright Fellow at Tufts University, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, following a BFA at the Concordia University in photography and a BA in history at the University of Saskatchewan. Recent exhibitions include the Kansas City Art Institute's H&R uh, Block Art Space, Hui Museum, Museum of Photography in Amsterdam, the Kennedy Museum of Art at Ohio University, Studio Museum in Harlem, the National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C., uh, MOCAD in Detroit, the Durban Art Gallery in South Africa, and ROM in, uh, here in Toronto. His works have been recognized with awards, including an independent study fellowship at the Whitney Museum of American Art, and Art Matters Fellowship Canada Council for the Pre Canada Council for the Arts Production Grants um, and an artist residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. 
His works are in institutional collections, uh, including the Studio Museum, at ROM, the Saskatchewan Arts Board, and the Center for Photography at Woodstock. Dawit is represented by Tiwani Contemporary in London and is currently a visiting artist at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the Department of Photography. And there's just some images of his works. And this is a Strategic Withdrawal, which is included in the exhibition here. And I'm just making um, a quick reference, which we might also come back to. This is the obelisk of Axum that has informed this work. And it was stolen by, the, uh, by Mussolini's fascist government in the late 30s and taken to um, Rome where it was installed until it was then finally returned um, almost a century later. Well, 2008, I think, is when it began. And that's the plane. I just thought it was a great image that, that had to fit in the parts of this obelisk because it was so ma massive. So we have Nepsidu, whose art practice resides along a continuum comprised of conceptual and technical components originating from antiquity, made relevant for the present. His practice combines language, sculptural materials, and often prayer-like incantations that form a third space. This form of a practice is informed by the interplay of script, the poetic wave of architecture, and an affinity for community. To date, Sidhu has produced large-scale explorations around ancestor veneration, the divine feminine, and an intersection of myth and history. Recent exhibitions include Shadows in the Major Seventh at the Surrey Gallery of Art in BC, Aichi Triennial in Nagoya in Japan, Culture Shift, Contemporary Native Art Biennial in Montreal, Kill the Indian, Save the Man at Anchorage Museum of Alaska, and he was part of Genius at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle. All, that's all just 2016. <laughs> in September, NEP will be in a group exhibition at the Art Gallery of York University titled Migrating the Margins, Uploading the Toronto of Tomorrow with New Works. Lastly, he has just finished a short film for Shabazz Palaces titled Welcome to Quasars. With the divine feminine in mind, an awareness that bringing change to communities begins with empowering girls. Sidhu and his uh, family form Sheri Punjab Academy in their ancestral home in Chakar Punjab, which is an institution of boxing and learning for the village youth. In addition to the physical regimen, the students are also engaged by educational programming and life coaching. In line with this, Sidhu explores the intersection of ceremony and sport through his textile and adornment practice under the name of Paradise Sportif, creating these transportive costumes for women in the school to his collective Black Constellation and Shabazz Palaces. Aesthetic components drawn from myriad textile and ornament traditions, which lever a dialogue between sport and ceremony, collapsing different times and places. Moreover, there is always a celebration of the divine through each of his projects, as is with Malcolm Smile, which is part of this exhibition. And finally, we have Jarrett Vadera who is born in 1976 in, here in Toronto. He is an artist and cultural producer working between New York, Toronto, and India. Ver Videra works across media, primarily in the spaces where painting, photography, video installation, and new media intersect. Jarrett graduated from OCAD in 1999 and participated in the mobility program at the, in fine arts at the Cooper Union School um, of Art in New York. He received his Master in Fine Arts in Painting and Printmaking from the Yale School of Art in Connecticut in 2009. His mother and father both immigrated to Canada in the 1960s and 70s as part of a large wave of immigration. Videra's father was born in India and his mother in the Philippines, and he is of Indian, Filipino, and Spanish descent. His parents are working class immigrants who practiced different religions and spoke different languages. And he describes how growing up in his family in Toronto at that particular time, quote, set the stage for his ongoing explorations into the ways that beliefs, codes, and processes of translation shape and control how we see. Through his work, Videra explores how different social and technological and biological and cognitive processes shape and control the way that we see the world around and within us. He often takes things apart and puts them back together in new ways. Rorschach tests, 
a logarithms, maps, infographics, and logic paradoxes are often redeployed to locate ambivalent in between spaces, to reveal malignant, malignant meanings, and to explore the poetics of representation. Mixing metaphors, shifting historical and cultural re references, and code switching are some of his key strategies seen in his past work, which all relate to the three works included in this exhibition. In parallel to his career as an artist, Videra has also been active as an organizer, programmer, curator, researcher, writer, editor, educator, and designer on projects that focus on using art as a catalyst for social change and justice. He is currently a visiting instructor at Pratt Institute in the Art and Design Department, as well as the Social Sciences and Cultural Studies Department, and in the fall will become assistant professor in new media at the Department of Art at Cornell University in Ithaca. He has exhibited at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in New York, the Filipino American Museum in New York, Electronic Language International Festival Sao Paulo, A Space Gallery here in Toronto, Mariah Art Center Sharjah, MoMA New York, Baldaji Lad Museum in Mumbai, Queens Museum in New York. Vadera has received grants from the Canada Council of the Arts, Toronto Arts Council, and is currently an artist researcher in residence at Project for Empty Space in New York. And in the fall, we'll be doing a residency at the Al Sorco Residency in Dubai. So without further ado, I'm gonna just leave it there. What's it? I'll just leave it on yours for now. Yes. Thank you. We've all been talking over lunch and having these amazing conversations, and I was saying, please save it, because, of course, we have a number of great artists and uh, great thinkers. So, Sukena, I think I'm going to start with you. Um, you've brought in the reference to carpets and scrolls. Um, the carpet is a Bedouin's most prized possession. And, you know, it's within like tribes in uh, Arabia, Persia, and Anatolia. The carpet often offers shelter in the tent. It's a floor covering. And in terms of spiritual and religious practice, the carpet is in the furniture of paradise, as written in the Quran. And your beautiful new work, new work, History of the Defeated, you've made three references in a way to carpets, um, to the idea of a maquette and to scrolls. And can you speak a little bit about how you planned the work for this exhibition and how it connects to the carpet? And in, and in particular, in terms of our conversation, your particular interest in the action of rolling and enfolding. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, um, I think um, the, the relationship of um, my, um, the development of um, the idea of having something like uh, that resembles a carpet or a scroll come to the exhibition here and partly developed from um, my, my working with certain materials like latex um, as painting surfaces and over the last couple of years they, they started to transforming more into walls um, or floor surfaces that I would use in installations. For the for this exhibition, I think there, there was I was sort of interested in the collection a bit at the museum in terms of carpets, but also the idea of transporting a work of a kind of a, of a large ephemeral work across the across the Atlantic as well, and um, I think I, I kind of I wanted specifically to reference. Um, um, the idea of carpets as these artifacts that move around with people as they travel al along. And, um, and um, also kind of um, location markers as well. Um, and I was sort of interested also in terms of the way I, I've la also latex is rolled as a, as a material um, and how it arrives. And um, I think... Um, so yeah, I was, I was looking at rolling versus folding in some ways. I've often folded latex as well and other fabrics as I've worked with them and kind of worked with the marks that they've left. And in this case, I, I was really interested in um, 
kind of having this sort of floor surface worked object hang and to reveal that movement as well. Um, why and why latex? Why did you start working with latex? Um, I think it, it started first as um, I was exploring um, different different surfaces for painting, uh, and, and I, I was using materials like georgette and PVC um, <clears throat> as to experiment with with kind of breaking the surface of painting um, in terms of the abil ability of the material to reflect to to be seen through. And I think um, I think one of my colleagues actually was doing the masters had some latex around and I started working with it. And um, it so it has <clears throat> so many properties depending on its opacity and its reflection. So I actually started working with it first, exploring all these physical material aspects of it as a possible painting surface. And then as, it, as the sort of, um, I worked with it more and more. I was sort of interested in its history, its manufacture, um, and sort of relationships it has to maybe fetishism and um, architectural industry. So I kind of like the and hockey pucks. I like sort of exploring all its possibilities as a material as well. Oh yeah, you know, which is also hanging in kind of close proximity to your piece, and they're both sort of these screens and panels. Um, and Nep, you've also, I don't know if these are considered carpets for you or if they're considered textiles. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit about your reasoning for selecting this material to communicate this larger story uh, about this profound and very complex figure of, of Malcolm X. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess, um, personally, carpets, uh, sort of in the home I was brought up in as a, as a Sikh, were kind of um, um, an opportunity to take out any hierarchy when we uh, sit and eat and when we pray. We all sit at the same level. There's no, there's no hierarchy in the seating or in the arrangement from front to back or side to side. Um, so it always lent to this beautiful space that was always the, the truth of just you know, at the end of the day, we eat this way, we wake up, we pray this way. And it's, it felt natural to explore or honor um, Malcolm X through this. Um, you know, car and then, I mean, just, there has to be a, in taking up a subject uh, such as Malcolm X and his spirit. Um, there has to be a clearly a, a connection to the mud, to the sky, to to everything that was in Malcolm. Um, and so the carpets themselves uh, embody that in how they're made. Uh, if anyone has sat with a loomer for more than three minutes, you'll understand that there's a complete breath going inside of each decision of every strand. There's a natural rhythm taking place that goes inside that thread. It'd be crazy to think that such a thing is, is a uh, sterile, dead object after that amount of life has uh, produced it. So it's something that continues. It's something that, uh, it's, a, it's an object that continues to offer you know, because of how connected it is to the spirit of how it was made. Um, so that was, you know, it just really made sense to be able to honor Malcolm through uh, such a thing because uh, there's a lot of individuals, uh, me included, that, that understand that, you know, he's, Malcolm himself has not gone anywhere, you know, he continues to offer, so, yeah. I mean, this idea of the of the carpet also being this the space that's like a shared space. It's also a, a claiming of territory. I found that really interesting with with Sikhenim. You were, you know, speaking about Bedouins and um, the idea that it's hung on the wall or it's placed on the ground. And I think of that as like a marking of territory. And I think of your work, Babak, um, with this tombstone 
that is, again, it's, it's claiming a territorial space around it. And you've placed this, I hope you'll bear with me as I scroll through images. Oh, yeah. Uh, the one that says, nothing is worth dying killing for, which is, it's, is it a tombstone for you? or where? Because there, there's an artwork that's embedded inside. So maybe you could speak a little bit about. Sure. Um, I thought I was going to get the easy question. Um, I, was, I was going with what, the what idea would, of carpet for a What would be a, would for, be a basic for a question minutes. for you? No, no, no I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, the uh, sort of aesthetically, I'm, I'm quite, quite, I have been quite invest, invested and interested in, in minim minimalism, Western minimalism, uh, partially because um, it actually connects to to the cultural background that I'm coming from, and um, uh, if you kind of strip the cultural um, addendums or, or um, sort of Decor decorations away from uh, the culture, you, you actually see the simplicity and the minimal aspects of it. An example that I usually give is uh, Kaaba in, in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, which is a house of God built by Abraham and how, you know, it's one of the most minimalist pieces of architecture on earth. Um, and so I moved from that kind of uh, aesthetic attribution of objects to how bodies related and experiences um, um, architecture, space, and, and, uh, and other objects and, and people uh, themselves. Uh, so body is something that's always important for me and how it experiences uh, through movement. Uh, again, architecture is for me crucial because it dictates movement. Uh, so if any of us would like to go through this wall, we can't because, you know, there's a piece of wall that's been determining uh, movement and you have to kind of maneuver around it and negotiate your space around it to, to get through it. So bringing that to uh, this piece, uh, it, it does have a sense of, you know, play with architecture because uh, tombstone is usually laid on the ground. In this case, I wanted to lift it, but this idea of lifting is also this sort of notion of elevation and valuation that I, I was very interested in, uh, in terms of marking and, and um, v d uh, sort of, um, what was the word that you used? Uh, ter territory in terms of value. I'm, I'm interested in those two things. Um, and um, at the same time, uh, sort of uh, an object that could serve as a poem, um, which again is, is the, um, abstract architecture of the, of the culture that I come from, um, or kind of we all come from in that sense. Um, and inside of it, I mean, as, as kind of finished as this piece looks, um, inside of it there is a flat piece of art that's been sealed and embedded uh, that's going to be kept in, inside of this or encapsulated in this material for a hundred years. And as Swapna mentioned, if it's broken accidentally or intentionally, uh, the, the object's value goes to zero, as, as I've sort of declared it, um, both culturally and monetary. So it's this sort of uh, d delay of, uh, of a particular position that I'm in interested in that's been reflecting the past hundred years as sort of a pool or a ground for picking subjects and projecting them into the next hundred years. Um, I think that's sort of where I stop. And but in terms matters. of this kind of idea of marking territory, this is actually, it's a, it doesn't sit directly on the ground, it's actually no. lifted off of the ground. Yeah. So what was that decision in terms of not having it really marking the, the earth or the mud, even as Nep as you're saying? Um, I, I really didn't want it to be a tombstone. You know, I, I, di I didn't want it to be, a, I mean, tombstone is such a sort of fixed, heavy um, object and, and the connotation of it is so fixed that I just didn't want that. I wanted it to be movable, portable, uh, but almost like something that you put your foot on mm -hmm. as opposed to you stand uh, over and, and, you know, you position yourself against it. You kind of, uh, you can move it and move with it. Um, uh, and I think, 
the stele works really um, well with this piece because that's something that was supposed to be kind of permanently fixed into space and now we have it actually in the museum. Uh, so this idea of movement, I'm, I'm very much invested and interested in. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with these, these forms that man-made that jut out of the earth, these kind of tombstones, the steles, this, you know, the obelisk, this kind of the marking of great kings or fictional or, you know, the, um, the experience even like with Dawit. So uh, my first conversation with Dawit was on Skype and I was describing to him the stele and how I was kind of trying to think about curatorially framing this exhibition and he sort of laughed and said, well, I've, I've made a stele. And I couldn't understand how, I mean, it was just sort of a very, very magical connection. Um, and your approach to the stele or this obelisk Dawi, is that it's a story about cartogra cartographic demarcations um, in considerations of colonial past. Um, and there's a sight line in a way, even if, Babak, you don't want yours to be a tombstone, there's a sight line between your poem, let's call it a short poem on a, on a, on a hydrostone, to the stele that's part of the permanent collection here, to Dawit's that's supposed to move through, um, move through this exhibition. And yeah, Dawi, I wanted to, to ask you also, you know, maybe you can elucidate a little bit about this, the obelisk of Aksum, the photos I was showing before, and how that led to uh, the work strategic withdrawal that you've, that you made in 2013. I think just before I answer that, there's, sure. there's I walked straight from, from your piece to mine yesterday, and it's interesting to hear, um, you know, to hear you articulate the extent to which the form refers to its memorial function, but you're interested in it um, extending sort of beyond that. And I find myself um, doing almost the exact same thing, insisting that this is a stella which has this funerary boundary marking, territorial demarcation sort of function embedded within it. But the extent to which I'm interested in repurposing it as a minimalist form looks back at that history or the narrative that is encoded within it as an arc, as, as a as a historical object and then wants to propose but what does it you know what else can it uh, can it be um, so the original Stella was in 1892 the Italians lost uh, the Battle of Adwa against uh, against the Ethiopians and it was the first time that a Europeans had been defeated by an African force. And so this, I think this sits within the context of the Italian psyche, and it isn't until 1936 that Mussolini uses Eritrea as a jump off point to, to invade Ethiopia, and they're there for, for six years. The axiom of Stella is taken, broken up into three pieces, moved back into, you know, to, uh, to Italy. So that history is, you know, that, that history of, how that form functions for the colonial men mentality is crucial for me. But there's also this other aspect to it, which is I'm interested in contemporary movements of Eritreans, Ethiopians, East Africans across the Mediterranean into Italy. And the extent to which the contemporary movements across this body of water are rooted in the type of events that these stella that the removal sure. of the Stella exactly. sort of mark historically. And so what I've done with the Stella is rather than making it a fixed form, I've, it's just done in sort of simple, um, simple MDF, sort of untreated with a plexiglass vis, uh, vitrine on the top. And what is on the top is a three-dimensional photograph rendered in plastic, which is a geometric sort of abstraction of the space between the territorial claims between these two nations. So part of my use of this form, which marks a place, is to, on the one hand, push against the way in which the narrative of this form operates within a colonialist context, within an Italian set of histories, but by push, you know, by insisting on a different uh, possibility or a different um, sort of mode, you know, sets, uh, sets of meanings, firstly. And secondly, really locating contemporary events that circle back to these, you know, to these, um, to these original, you know, to these points of, uh, of, of, of encounter. Um, so what I want the form to do is you've placed yours off the ground in such a way that it is destabilized. What I've done is I've placed an object on the top, which as you get closer, 
the, the object disappears from view. As you get further, the object disappears from view. So it becomes a marker for instability. It, mar it becomes a marker for negating against the idea that a territorial marker mm -hmm. can locate a fixed, uh, a fixed form. And at the same time, it's a critique of minimalism and sort of, let's yeah. say, the monument. And I would say that with, with many of your works, um, whether they're, you know, it's smaller, non-tombstone babak. Um, Jarrett, your kind of large Rorschach vinyl. Sukena's work, very monumental in scale. And even Sean Saeed, uh, in terms of working in this kind of, again, monumental scale of, of abstraction. And there's, what, what's interesting for me with this exhibition and with, with working with all of you is that there's critiques around these sort of larger canons. And that is fascinating in terms of how do we move past a conversation of identity in relation to working with minimalism, abstraction, um, and kind of finding new forms for conceptual art practices, you know, amongst this kind of generation. Um, maybe Jarrett, you know, you've been very quiet thus far, patiently waiting. Maybe we could talk a little bit about your kind of, you know, the way that you um, translate or retranslate or break apart the image and then reconstruct it and particularly with an interest in, in the abstract. Yes. Okay. Which I would say, I mean, in, in a sense, just to also, maybe we can start with Ascent, which is in the tunnel. Sure. Which is an abstraction, but very much based on a, on a, a film of reality, to um, the collage that's upstairs. Sure. So, um, I resonate a lot with uh, what's been said already today. Uh, this idea of taking something that is uh, perceived to be fixed and then to unfix it uh, because nothing under the sun is fixed. That's something that I feel like is part of um, a lot of the work that I see in the show and some of the things that we've talked about. Sort of the spaces of translation um, in between a thing and another thing as it becomes another thing and what that, what that sort of means. So with Yes. Can you hold your mic up? Uh, okay. Um, so with the piece downstairs, um, uh, ascent, I don't know if you, everybody's seen it, but it's, I guess it's about 80 feet long, and it's a two-channel um, video installation, which was really uh, a pleasure to work on, um, although it might have been a logistical nightmare on some levels uh, for the museum to try to figure out how to do it. But it was uh, an installation that I was uh, allowed to do, or we sort of conceptualized around the architecture of the space, and then trying to think about how to um, transport the viewer as they were walking from one um, level to the next at the same time. And it was, uh, it seemed ideally made for another work that I had already worked on before, um, which was, uh, which the name is Ascent as well. And I've often been interested in the image as a pharmacon, as both the poison and the cure, right? As language as a pharmacon. Uh, and so for me, what was, uh, I, I did a series of uh, video experiments where I was, uh, I shot some video of light reflecting off of water. And then I did some very, very small tweaks uh, in, um, can I, in can I just theater. ask, why did you film light reflecting off of water? Well, the, so uh, I looked at different representations of how we think about consciousness, right? And so light is one of the main ways that we think about um, value in terms of knowledge, value in terms of vision. It relates directly to the Enlightenment project. It relates back to me uh, to this idea of our innate fear, or maybe not innate fear, but our uh, socially constructed reinforced fear of the dark, you know, that may have um, primordial sort of undertones. But this idea of the light, the candle, knowledge, all of that stuff is, is a subcontext in a lot of my work. But the idea of um, light as knowledge or as consciousness is something that's been through many different cultures um, throughout history, right? But the idea of light reflecting off of water, you can never focus specifically on fixing it as a thing. Right? You look at water, it's always shimmering, right? The chimera um, is something you can never quite grasp fully. Um, but you can name it, but the naming in, it, in and of itself is a paradox because the thing is um, ever shifting. So I, I decided to start with that. Yeah, and then I, and then I changed the, uh, the lens, basically. The way that most digital images are made is they're on, uh, uh, they're, you know, little dots, they're pixels on an X and Y coordinate, uh, you know. So I just took out the Y coordinates 
um, and then was interested to see what the image would then do with the original phenomenon. Would it still communicate when the language or the structure had changed? So the video, just to clarify, the video in the uh, tunnel area that's leading from the parking lot into the ascending into the museum is essentially a video of light reflecting off of water with the grid yes. just deconstructed, essentially, and then which looks like a, a series of bands. Um, so it's a very immersive work, and then you've also added the sound element into that. Um, and during our install, uh, you were thinking a lot about portals and sort of being transported. Yeah, and so, so the, um, in the process of uh, perceiving the world, uh, we're often, uh, we are also doing violence to what may be, right? So the world around us as we understand it, um, we're, we're making sense of it. We're making it make sense for our brains. Uh, and it's, you know, we are um, technology as well, information or data comes in through our eyes, gets processed in our brain somewhere and then, uh, somewhere and then we spit it back out as language to other people. So I'm, I'm interested in, um, in that process in, in a lot of different ways. And so understanding that process um, and understanding everything as a series of translations and, uh, and thinking through uh, what's beneath our translations and our language and the world that we see around us is something I'm very interested in. Um, and so that in some ways becomes a form of uh, thinking about what's between and what's uh, below and what's beyond. And, and uh, I mean, maybe that's a question for all of you though. Why is that, why is that relevant, looking at the space in between? Does culture come into that? Does identity come into that? You know, we're here because we're, this is an exhibition of Canadian art, Canadian artists, um, but is it an exhibition of Canadian art? And, you know, maybe that's just a happenstance connection that we all have to be Canadian, but does that play into your positionality? Is that of interest? Like, you know, Jarrett, you kind of, uh, you know, you grew up very, like, directly across the street from here in Flemington Park, which is, um, it's sort of a landing point for immigrants, including my parents when they first arrived here, and then you kind of hope to move out of it. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, not to delve so much into biography, but to really think about what is informing these sort of practices. Like Babak, I feel like you're always critiquing sort of photography. Uh, you know, you're living and working in Vancouver and, and you're out to question the sort of tradition of photography there. Um, Sukina, so you're considering latex as a surface for an abstraction. Uh, Dawit, you're creating these sort of monuments that are minimal and uh, also working with low materials. You know, and then Nep, I think that your relationship to abstraction is really interesting in terms of text and creating a sort of architectural abstraction out of text and using something like Kofik script, which is very rooted in a certain tradition of sort of writing and, uh, and an abstraction in itself. So, I don't know if we, who, I don't have a question in particular, but maybe there's some sort of conversation or yeah. comments that you can. I think the thing yeah. that I, I, know. I think so much better without the microphone, but it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that, that we're, almost all of us are working in one form or another um, in proximity to the, you know, to histories of abstraction and minimalism. And so I think about, rather than thinking about the spaces within, I think, I mean, I speak for myself, it, perhaps it's a matter of the spaces within, but also the spaces at the edge of certain dominant narratives of minimalism or abstraction in the, the, in the way that they were presented to me within the context of a Western education. But then the, you know, the, the cultural forums that, that I saw within the context of my own cultural sort of upbringing and understanding that there was a his, different historical trajectory and a different set of uh, possibilities for what constituted abstraction, that it could be rooted in proximity to things in the real world, that it wasn't about you know, this absolute negation or pursuit of, of, uh, of purity, for example. Right that it could come back to something that's sort of tangible. And so finding the, you know, finding the space at the edge of the type of narratives that allow these types of, of, of explorations for me is, um, is significant. So that the work isn't just about, I'm so-and-so from such and such a place, but that it's the experiences and the questions can be rooted within the forms and the materials that register in a particular way here, you know? Um, 
like one may look at the plexiglass, one may look at the, you know, the language of industrialization that is rooted in that form, but it's, that's one space, you know, but there are multiple spaces around which these things, uh, I think, can be examined. Should, should I? Of course. May I? Um, I keep thinking about this notion of minimalism and sort of wanting to say something about it because I think my career actually started from this interest in minimalism and, uh, and abstraction. And I was really fascinated by uh, this essay by, um, ironically, an architect from Vienna um, by the name of Adolf, name, name of Adolf Loos. And um, the, the, I encourage all of you to, to read it. It's a short essay called Ornament and Crime. And this is a time that Europe is going through a, a sort of a shift in terms of uh, style and, and understanding of what modernity is actually doing um, to, to lifestyle. And um, the, the, the idea of white cube hasn't sort of been defined yet. So Loos proposes it. And the example that he uses is uh, a critique of tattoo, basically. So he proposes that if you see somebody with a tattoo, either in their past they've committed a crime, they're just about to commit a crime, or in a very near future they will definitely commit a crime. Um, and if you don't have it, it's basically that sort of pure essence of uh, sort of modern good man that, that they, they propose. He also wrote another book called How a Modern Man Should Dress. But um, when you look at his spaces, uh, that were void of this idea of ornamentation. So he, he was like all these Art Nouveau and Art Deco buildings that had overt ornamentation to his eyes. Um, they had wasted labor and everything needed to be just minimal and, and white. Um, but when you look at that, the implication of what he proposed, it's actually quite ornamental. Uh, there is not a square footage of his buildings that doesn't have a Persian carpet covering it. And I was really interested in that. Um, uh, and how I arrived at it was this, uh, b between that sort of idea of uh, examining ornamentation and uh, sort of purification of, of, of an object, uh, but also in terms of valuation again. So I, I um, looked at these Persian carpets with tons of ornamentation and I painted them white over and over and over. Uh, until y you would look at a white painting, essentially. And then you come closer, and this damn dye that they used still seeped through. You could still see it. Uh, so I, I kind of gave up. And from a distance, you see a monochrome, but when you go closer, you see all the um, ornamentation, essentially, that's been buried. So this sort of vulgar act of, um, and, and violent act of erasure, which is also another kind of... Um, method of, of uh, modern art in terms of erase the Kooning or uh, a more recent one with the Chapman brothers sort of uh, defacing Goya's um, uh, was I was very interested in that but then the question of valuation came to play and uh, you know you all of a sudden had this valuable Persian carpet well 10 minutes ago I was just walking on it it had no value you know and you know we barely vacuum it, and now all of a sudden it has value, you know, when it's uh, recontextualized re and contextualized within a frame, and, and a frame of history, all of a sudden it has value. So um, I, I, I'm constantly going back to those two notions um, of, of minimalism uh, and maximalism, essentially. I mean, carpets could be, could be looked at in those uh, notions as well. And then this idea of valuation. How do we determine these things? How do we value um, a particular culture or, or by assigning certain thing to a quote-unquote culture, then value gets construction. So for me, the idea of um, cultural identity that gets sort of labeled on, which closes uh, interpretation for me, which I always push against, is directly related to value systems. Um, it's extremely easily marketable and does very well in those, uh, in those uh, senses. And uh, the problem with it is that it sort of fixes it again, which is that idea of mon monumentality that I'm not very interested in. And it, it, it sort of kills it in a way. So I just, I know Nap wants to say something and then 
depending on what you say and where it goes, I do want to go back to Jarrett. And no, no, I want you. You go first. Oh, okay. this is not uh, in relation to my man, but uh, yeah, being Punjabi and a minimalist is like an oxymoron. <laughs> it's like a. Nep, Nep they, has this. What's can I say? It? A, I'm not gonna say it. You go. What's that? Scarborough. Scarborough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, there's a joke actually. Um, there's a joke. It goes, uh, you know, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna rob a Indian person's home, like don't don't do it on the night of when they're going to a wedding because the wife wears all the jewelry to the she doesn't leave anything at home. It's just more is more. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, I don't, you know, personally, I don't have this relationship with uh, minimalism as an aesthetic uh, that I think about in this way. I, I just don't. That's just me. Um, but when I think about it, as I've looked back more and more into where I came from and where my, you know, what was taught to me at home, there's a... Minimalism is a is a is almost a device in Sikh spirituality. It's it's used as a through line to cut through superstition, to cut through false uh, re religious recital. Um, it's it's used as a device to keep us as close as we can to the truth, so that no false ritual gets in the way of the truth. And Mother Nature being our ruling, um, it allows us to, to continue to have a progressive discussion about it because minimalism can move beautifully and quickly to the place that, that grounds us. Um, man, it's only getting harder. It's not like, you know, it's like the, you have these dere coming up that are fake, sort of almost gurdwares that are popping up in our villages where people are taking advantage of how open the practice is and plural is, uh, how plural uh, the practice is, I'm sorry, of Sikhism, and now getting, starting to get in the way of it by setting up their own temples that are in the way of it. Again, though, minimalism as a device of spirituality, I think, is maybe where I, that's, that's, uh, that's my relationship to it. Yeah. So I think what's so interesting is that there's a reclamation Maybe that's not even the right word. There's a, an ownership of how these um, these sort of asserted art historical canons have Im have been embedded into a larger popular culture, and the, the way that all of you are working is to create your own sort of form and language of what those larger canons actually mean. Um, you know, so I have two things, and then you can answer or not answer, uh, Jarrett just in relation to what you're saying, Babak, about value. You know, Jarrett, your work with the Diseases of the Eyes series and this kind of idea of what we consider a value and when we consider it valuable. So when I think back to the stele, that is, you know, my kind of touchstone for the show, it's, it was just a piece of marble that was discovered and then maybe somebody thought it was a nice piece to then use to honor their brother as, you know, he was buried in the 10th century. But what is... What is valuable about it? Now it's presented as this artifact in this you know, climate-controlled museum. And I often think that where is it going to be in the future? Maybe it, it will be and reclaim another sense of value. And you often use currency. And then with Sukena, I just want to say this before I forget, <laughs> is that you, what I like with your work is you, you often mentioned um, people touching the latex and leaving the fingerprint and the finger mark. And I think that's really interesting also in, in relationship to value, but also the, the assertion of the bodily presence onto this kind of uh, abstract minimal form. It's a very direct, um, yeah, the marking becomes very different and very visceral. So maybe, I don't know, Jared, do you want to speak a little bit about diseases of the eye? Uh, and sure, I'll just sure. toggle through. I think um, values. <laughs> Value is a function of a lens or a frame, right? So something can be valued by one culture and devalued by another culture. Something can be projected upon uh, that has incredible value uh, and it's, 
project upon, and it has uh, little to no value. So partly to answer a lot of the other questions as well is that I feel like growing up in this context, you know, moving between um, uh, the, Philipp uh, you know, spending time in the Philippines and in India, in the US and in Canada, you often feel, or I often feel, that uh, my perspective or many of the perspectives uh, represented in the show are not um, carried at the same value, right? There's not that lens or the lens of um, the horizontality of art histories is not really talked about, right? So we, I mean, me growing up through the, the education system in, in Canada and then in the US, uh, we are often uh, it completely invisible it, or we're um, hyper visible in very, um, very corny, stereotypical ways, right? So I think many of us navigate that on a daily basis, and we're not naming it in a certain way here because then to name in some ways gives it power, but also because I think that for me personally, it's not just about one specific narrative. I think in many cultures around the world, there are hegemonic narratives uh, that are perpetuating the, the power structure that exists in that culture, right? And so when I'm in India, there's a very particular dynamic between genders and religions and castes and classes. When I'm in the US, everybody's talking about race in a very particular binary. In Canada, we kind of focus on nation states and think about identity in relation to nation states. So I, I think that it is true, like with what Dewey was saying, is that we often operate in relation to, but are taking our own voice um, and spelling out our own language in another way. So I think that's partly how I'm seeing a lot of the things that, that we're, we're talking about as well. But I think in terms of thinking about perception, for me, it in some ways uh, takes me out of the local binaries to think that human beings uh, process the world we perceive based on our memories and based on our cultural um, histories and based on language. That for me, um, not universalizes in a way to um, homogenize, but but takes it out of the very particular binary politics that can keep us in these colonial boxes of identity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I want I want to go back a bit to what you're talking about, Adolf Loos, and then also like sort of minimalism versus ornamentation, and there there's sort of I think sort of studying architecture. There's this of attraction and of love you have for, mate for materials and sort of the sense of purity. And I think, I mean, even as I kept working through painting as well and installation eventually, um, there's always sort of this idea and I, I've, I've always found it, I found this sort of love-hate thing I have. There's this idea of, um, I, I also always wonder whether with a lot of, work that I do and maybe people in similar circumstances do, there's a particular attraction to um, sort of minimalism that it can in some way avoid that particular stance and sort of have a blank where you can sort of throw in many ideas. And um, so anyway, this is some kind of question um, I have about it and, and the idea of um, architecture becoming this sort of framing device that sort of opens up other um, sort of other possibilities of throwing in rugs or um, pieces and and sort of re and removing sort of meaning. Um, and I, yeah, I was, I was thinking in terms of when I sort of work with latex as well, one of the things that attracts me the, to the material is, is the fact that if it's sort of varnished in a certain way or treated in a certain way, it almost disappears in some ways and just hold the paint somehow that, that kind of hovers above it. And at the same time, it can kind of capture fingerprints that come from the manufacturing process or from my manipulation of it and from other people who, who make it roll, roll, roll the piece. So it kind of becomes this uh, surface that can both um, disappear in a sense and disintegrate eventually, which it will. And um, something that, cap that all that remains in the end is sort of the paint and, and sort of the patina and the oils from fingerprints. So I'm kind of, it's kind of, kind of see it always as this very, very blank thing that will eventually go away and kind of leave nothing, but kind of a, a trace or a perception or something. Yeah. If I could 
could just speak to that. I think that there's, it's, I'm curious what you mean when you say a blank, because it's, it's you know, the way in which um, sort of Kovina Mercer talks about this discrepant abstraction, so that a surface is never ever entirely um, reducible to a singular sort of element. And so he wants to utilize that as a framework for talking about sort of history. And I think part of my, um, when I started graduate school in Boston, part of my insistence on working with, with a certain language which was incredibly sort of removed, which was quite, uh, quite white in terms of the materials that I was using, was my reflection on the Canadian landscape. Uh, so there, there's, but that part of the narrative could not, you know, could not operate relative to the specificity of my body. And so I then begin to sort of think about, okay, so if minimalism is really asking me to think about the encounter, the encounter between the object and, 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 um, and the person who's in front of it, then I have to really think about the specific dimensions of what this body is in front of that object and what kind of trajectory that then allows me to insert into the narrative that the object sort of allows, you know? And so, when I begin to think about, I, uh, Stanley, you know, Stanley Brown or um, Rashida Rini, uh, Nasrini Mohammadi, and seeing these forms that are being made at the same time as a lot of these other um, sort of minimalist sort of giants and thinking about the space between how the narrative around those works operate and this, you know, and what is in, in my immediate uh, environment. So at that point, it becomes for me a real political sort of gesture to say, I take it on, but part of what I'm taking on is the history, but also, as you've said, Jared, the art histories, and this insistence that um, it cannot be reducible to a certain narrative, not just because I'm using it, but because the object itself insists on a different set of historical possibilities. You know, so that blankness in there is always this dirty blankness, if you will. So it's not even, yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I know there is, there is sort of, um, yeah, I, I sort of agree. I mean, there is this idea of my sort of discomfort with it somehow. This, I mean, there is this. It's it's always problematic. My attraction to okay. to minimalism. It's it's always, it's it's always also. I think for me, it also has these sort of connotations, especially in terms of architecture. That the, the era of architecture in the Middle East when I left, where sort of this kind of enlightened modernity and um, this sort of cleanliness and removal of the removal of ornament sort of is, is also kind of a, is, is a removal of of a narrative in some way and um, so I always have this um, yeah this issue issue with it in that sense as well um, but I, I, I still remain attracted to minimalism as, to, to minimalism as, or to ornamentation no no to minimalism and uh, I mean even even within there, there is this, I, I don't know if that happens uh, with many with uh, with anyone else, but there's always within. Um, there's this need for me to see, the, um, kind of this maybe sort of spiritual <laughs> essence or something in 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 a, in a blank wall. Um, you know, I can't see why, for example, there is this pattern here and. Without, you know, in this building, I can, um, I think especially in terms of, uh, um, I, I think the, the problematic of, sim of symbolism maybe being, um, is about, or, or ornamentation is about taking a certain cultural stance, and so uh, minimalism stands in opposition to that in some way. But I mean, this is because in Napier, the complete opposite in terms of being a ma maximalist yeah. in this kind of sense, in the way that you sort of use ornamentation and color and form is, you know, it can be, it's ceremonial, it's excessive, and at the same time, it's, um, you know, it's very interesting when we installed and finally sort of lifted these three carpets, the robes that are in the permanent collection kind of sprang to life because of their relationship with each other. Um, so may, maybe you can answer in this kind of way of the, op the opposite of, <laughs> let's move away from minimalism. Maybe just, you know, let's. 
Um, yeah, I just, you know, it's just, I, and I'm just being dead honest. I don't, I understand the history of minimalism, uh, the, the beauty, the poetic of it, but I just don't make work that way, uh, where I think of it as um, excessive or reduced or reductive. And um, I, I, I just don't, and, and I, I'm not, I'm not saying that by um, any means by dismissing minimalism, you know. I, I just mean, I'm being honest in my practice, I just don't. It, what comes out is um, something I gotta figure out, like, you know, maybe later, but I, I just try not to get in the way of it. That's, that's what I try to do. I just try not to get in the way of uh, what's happening and how it was sent, and how it was given. Uh, so yeah, that doesn't answer your question at all. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I don't, don't expect anything less. So um, I don't always talk about minimalism. I know you want to get acro acro away from it, but, but in the same way I think... I do, I think actually, I think it's really interesting that we're speaking about um, this kind of one form, because of course, we're attracted to, of course, you kind of look back to Nazir right. Muhammadi or, you know, there's, there's, uh, there, there are so many other languages and we see it here in this museum in the permanent collection as well, so. Sure, because so for me, I, I think that there's, um, we've been talking about minimalism with a big M, like yeah, Western exactly. minimalism. Exactly. We've also been talking about um, uh, clarity and efficiency of communicating through minimal means. Uh, we're also talking about abstract systems that talk about um, uh, deeper and parallel philosophies as well. But I also uh, believe we're also talking about um, minimal or uh, cleanliness or sterility as part of uh, our everyday visual culture, which relates to capitalism and uh, production as well. So this aesthetic of less is more, this um, the, you know the, the sort of uh, ripe relationships between um, different ideologies that are that are hidden in these models of efficiency and purity are very interesting. And for me, uh, I'm very interested in um, the aspiration towards a white box and the constant refusal of time and the constant insistence of um, entropy and humanity to disrupt this ideal. So this, this, um, this juxtaposition between something that wants to be a monument and will forever be breaking down. Um, and so I think that that shifting nature of value and um, uh, in relationship to, to something that is, is, is aspiring to be fixed also relates in many ways to these different frames that we operate within and that are, you know, Canadian frame or, you know, our historical frame or gender or this and that. And I think it's important. I think that's kind of why we're getting back to this in different ways. But yeah. I think in, in a sense, I mean, my interest with, um, you know, working with all of you is that each of you have very layered um, processes and thinking and your, your references are so wide and uh, so fascinating in that way. So when we're you know, when we're looking at sort of this idea of Canadian artists um, and in terms of this kind of title of the show and like locating, you know, you guys are working in, you're working across different geographies and, um, you know, we're having Skype conversations at like different time period, you know, time, different times. And, um, and I'm, I think my larger thing is that we're here to speak about the sort of Canadian artists and the Canadian identity. And at the same time, I think really we have, we have larger practices that maybe have more in common than maybe nationhood, and I think that's really fascinating. Um, and I hope that comes out of this exhibition in a sense. Um, and, uh, you know, in a way, I wonder how do we move beyond these sort of um, calls for representation, even if there is so necessary and so needed across institutions, um, how do we move across or move away from sort of being uh, part of a sort of South Asian community and or South Asian art practice, or um, looking at you know African Canadian diaspora exhibitions. Like, how do we move away from that, and how do we kind of just be a sort of global artist, which you seem to all already be? 
for me, there's a simple, you know, it really is a simple answer. And I realized that these things are not mutually exclusive. So I stopped thinking that I could not be an African Canadian, I could not be an, so that it's contextually driven, mm -hmm. you know, so that there are instances in which I, you highlight a different part of, uh, you know, of what you want to highlight. But that it really becomes a whole bunch of commas, you know, um, between these different adjectives. The layering. And absolutely, the mm -hmm. layering that moves. You said horizontality, so it's, mm -hmm. um, I'm proud of all of these different affiliations. Like, I truly, truly am. But I'm simply getting smarter at recognizing which one do I use and when and why. That's a great yeah. answer. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Uh, the uh, oh, that was great. Um, the end. <laughs> we're gonna take a fifteen-minute break now. Um, if I just heard right, right, swaps, you were talking about the. Is it the bag of like identity that comes with? How do we break out of that, like the constantly the identity it crisis mean, artists? Like, so would, would you consider okay. yourself a Canadian artist? I don't know, because even like, you know, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, be cute, but even the, like, the, if break it down, like even artist, you know, there's a, I'm not, I don't come from a place that has a name for that. And the people I run with also, come from a place where there's no kind of name for... What about artisan? Uh, uh, yeah, no, there's like, there's deep engraver, you know, fast embroiderer, there's these things. But artist, yeah, so I don't really got anything for that. Um, but the identity thing is, is, a, is, is sometimes a funny one. And I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't even take on the responsibility of how we break away from that because it's not on us. I think the lens <laughs> that's looking at us like that, it, they gotta go figure that out, you know? I, I know they Which haven't figured, for the most part, they haven't figured it out, but it's, um, I think sometimes it com the fascination with identity sometimes comes from uh, an assembly of people that perhaps maybe lack, feel they lack their own, you know? So when they see it, it's fascinating, you know? And it needs to be spoken of. And sometimes people write, write a script in a certain way where they are the all great connector of these people's identities and to bring them together. And um, I'm not, I don't, I don't bear any responsibility. I just continue, I know the work I'm making and we are making um, comes from a place. Um, but it, what they want to call it, that's on them. I didn't come up with that name or those names, you know. It's cool, but I just, I just hope it doesn't, I just, the only responsibility I have in that is trying not to let it get in the way, be it the didactic or the, you know, the programming around it. I, that's the only thing I, I, that's my responsibility is when the artwork is there, I just don't want, anything to get in the way of, of it. Because just as a person who's been, you know, when I look at like the works that have moved me or, or movies or music, I didn't have someone saying, you know, oh, this is Afrofuturism meets Punjabi pacifism meets. <laughs> it's like, no, you know, that is crazy. And uh, it limits the actual magic, you know? Sure. Um, yeah. Punjabi pacifism. That's yeah, the I'll next say title. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. You're going to end up wearing these pants. <laughs> Should we all respond or do you want us it, to? It's up to you. I mean, it's, I'm also um, just being cognizant of time, so sure. I don't know if we want to open it up for questions or if you have more that you want to add to this conversation. I mean, it's just variations of what have been said. It's um, uh, for me, in terms of our professional life, in terms of art, um, it, it, it's, I've never been clear about um, a relationship than I am uh, as, um, uh, in terms of the relationship between this label, 
whatever it is, uh, the African American artist or uh, Middle Eastern artist or South Asian artist to the market. Um, this is extremely clear to me and I unfortunately I haven't smartened up enough yet to um, to go with the flow um, and, and maybe make mo money out of it because it's very easy at this point for, for uh, me to do that but I have I've been sort of I have the sickness of resisting that kind of um, attention uh, but also in terms of Canadianness I was, I was just thinking about it because it becomes really kind of um, as soon as you have a nation attached to a body then it becomes dehumanized I feel like okay well me as a human goes after me as a person that's attached to a piece of land or attached to a passport and um, I, I, I hold three passports I hold Iranian American Canadian passports and in that sense, I've smartened up. So when I cross the border from here to the States, I always show them my American passport so I don't have to be subject to cavity search. Um, uh, and when I'm coming back, I, I do the Canadian one. And when I'm going to Istanbul, for example, I use my Iranian one because for Canadian and Americans, you have to pay 100 bucks visa, formal visa. So it's free for Iranians, so I just use that. Um, but, um, but at the same time, this sort of notion of uh, you know, what happens to us as humans and individual experiences that we go through, does that have no value? Does uh, this idea of history of a piece of border or a piece of land that's been fought over and over um, uh, and that's my label, that's what I get, you know, after 21 centuries or 20 centuries. And the other thing which, if I were to agree to a label of Canadian and the commonality of experience is, um, two things. One is that one way or another we kind of all link historically to some sort of trauma, which I, I, I really like because it's a common ground. And the other thing is our sort of openness to therapy. I really like that. You know, Canada, I think we're ahead of the game in that sense. We, we, you know, we're open to this notion of getting therapy. That means that we actually are open to talking. Um, and in, in those terms, I think we are ahead of the game in 21st century um, uh, over some other nations like uh, our, our friends in the South. That's what I ask. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to say, well, just in terms of the wits of uh, just uh, talking about sort of the smartness of, of which, which, which identity to talk about. I think I, I kind of see it in a way there, there is this sort of, um, I, I see that uh, I, I can, <clears throat> what I thought he might mean or uh, point to is also this ability to take on different hats and different positions according to a scenario. I could see it as sort of uh, an, an artist from a certain country. I could see it as a Canadian. I could see it as someone who has always had a difficulty with identity, but it's been forced upon me. And um, I, I kind of, I can see this ability to navigate it as, as something, I think, more akin to that, uh, or some sort of the advantages you can gain from being kind of taking all these different hats, yeah. yeah I, I agree. I just wanted to say one, one thing really quick. Um, so I, a few months ago, I was, uh, doing a talk on Filipino diasporic identity. Uh, you know, two weeks ago I was doing one on South Asian American identity, and today we're talking about Canadian identity. And, you know, I, I do uh, respect sort of the space that art allows me to occupy, which is this quasi-free space, whatever that means for me, but I do feel a safety in my studio and when I'm making work. And I think that's a kind of uh, decolonial process. It's something that disconnects me in many ways from um, all the other uses that I need to perform in the world. But I do also take on that challenge as well. And so I, I feel like many of us in different ways, we, uh, we work as educators uh, or I have um, tried to curate some exhibitions um, and what I'm often trying to do is uh, not try to change the system or uh, convince those other people that are not invested at all in this, in, in this experience, but just to uh, write more and, and maybe uh, create a platform for other people like you're doing with this show or like we're doing right now to talk about this transcultural, transnational, not fitting into a box, multi-positional, shape-shifting, reality that many of us 
in Canada or that affiliate at least part of the time with Canada um, feel. And that may be one of the things that I, I identify with the, the Canada that I grew up with, this shape-shifting sort of simultaneity and difference and multivalence. Um, but not in a not in a in a corny multicultural. It's a small world after all. But actually, it's a series of of real negotiations that are constantly happening in this network of relations that we have. Uh, just one second. Um, I got to quote my man Mekoyo Ali Barnes on this one. Uh, he said a beautiful thing when we were showing at the uh, Fry Museum in Seattle because everything around our, uh, our bios and the work was issued, uh, identity, uh, issues of identity-based artists, artists with identity issues who tackles issues of identity. And McCoyle was like, look, uh, if we had any issues with our identity, our work wouldn't look like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't got no issues with our identity. <laughs> like, it smells and looks like this because there are no issues that we have. <laughs>